I don't think this kind of reporting system can show a clear cause and effect association. I think what it allows someone to do is to raise a potential concern that warrants further investigation. But really the cause and effect association is best demonstrated through carefully designed randomized controlled trials or case control studies, neither of which this reporting system is. Well, typically a, tr a medication requires several positive randomized controlled trials before approval by the FDA. But in the case of Parkinson's disease psychosis, given the clinical significance of the syndrome and the limited treatment options available, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for this compound and allowed one positive clinical trial to be sufficient for FDA approval. That single positive trial, the pivotal trial as it's, shown, as it's called, demonstrated clear efficacy and adequate safety and tolerability as well. I think the risk-benefit ratio needs to be made at an individual patient level when initiating antipsychotic therapy in someone who has Parkinson's disease or someone with any neurodegenerative disease, including dementias. You have to weigh the potential benefit of decreasing the paranoia and hallucinations that occur as part of psychosis against any potential morbidity or mortality that might be associated with prescribing that antipsychotic. One has to consider that this condition, Parkinson's disease psychosis, is associated with increased mortality itself, also with risk for institutionalization and caregiver burden and decreased quality of life. So that individual risk-benefit ratio needs to be made at the individual patient level when deciding whether to treat an uh, Parkinson's disease psychosis with an antipsychotic. So when first evaluating and treating a patient with Parkinson's disease psychosis, a key component is actually education of the patient and the family to help them understand the nature of the symptoms, the potential causes of the symptoms. Subsequent to that, there are behavioral management strategies that are available to help without the use of medications to manage psychosis in the home environment. Often the Parkinson's disease neurologist will critically evaluate the Parkinson's medications that the patient is taking and seeing if any decreases or discontinuations can be made in medications that may be contributing to the psychosis. Sometimes an evaluation for a comorbid or concomitant medical condition that might be contributing to the psychosis will also occur. Once the decision is made to actually prescribe an antipsychotic, other than pimavanserin in the United States, there are other available antipsychotics. The most commonly prescribed one is quetiapin, for which the evidence base, the scientific evidence base, is quite limited. Clinicians, practitioners have experience prescribing quetiapin, but we don't have evidence from efficacy studies that it's actually efficacious. Clozapine is another antipsychotic that has been demonstrated to be efficacious, but due to the blood monitoring that's required with clozapine use, it's rarely used in patients with Parkinson's disease psychosis. There are a host of other antipsychotics that are available, but very few that have been um, used in Parkinson's disease and many of them have significant concerns about safety and tolerability when applied to this population. I agree with that statement. I think there's already the black box warning contained in Pimavanserin's label that applies to all antipsychotics and that when they're used in dementia-related psychosis patients, there is an increased risk of mortality concern. Outside of that, I think there were no specific morbidity and mortality concerns that were identified in the randomized clinical trials that would lead one to have any other warnings or specific concerns at this point in time when prescribing pimavanserin in Parkinson's psychosis patients.